could, yeah, he could stand up here with us, but, but we'll let him be. I put the link in the Ask newsletter. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. But, I no mean, one. we have, like, I looked at it this morning, including us two. We have, like, I don't really want to talk about, like, I don't know anything about my neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. And I, like, didn't go through, like, yeah, I mean, I've spoken to a couple of my friends about it. It's not that big a deal. Um, like, the people I got to sign, like, everyone who signed up. Yeah? How are you got, like, two people, two what? of my friends to sign up. Mm -hmm. But none of it is, like, from Facebook. Oh, really? I, need to I didn't even know that. To Today. So that's what we're reduced to water polo like now rather than no basketball. <laughs> the only problem is that it, no, no, only the few people who watch water polo yeah. know that's yeah, the guys it. Yeah. Yeah. We're like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe this will be really awkward too. Yeah. Yeah. Volley, we, volleyball. I mean, like, are we still a volleyball thing? power or no? Yeah. And then, like, it's like, if we only have 10 people, I'm going to have to cut it down. Because yeah, uh, that's why I was like, I. I'm not gonna. <coughs> that's the Omaha. That's the that's the one they play in Omaha, right? The college the baseball. Yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't know what our setup's gonna be like. We'll have to talk to them one day. Uh, but yeah. This this year especially. I mean, I don't think it's. No. As if he was already a star coach, right? I mean, it's, it's, what would they base it on? He really screwed up. I mean, there were at least seven games which have won this season with decent coaching. But they led with five minutes to go, and then this came apart at the end because, you know, you didn't know when to call a timeout. You know? I know very little about basketball, but as I used to be calling a timeout now. Are we ready? Um, okay. It's yours. Yeah. Hello, everybody. It's on. It's, it's on. Could I have your attention, folks? Hi, my name's Kyle Booten, um, and I'm here with Janice Young. They, I don't think they can hear you. So. Is it on? It is on. Uh, my name's Kyle Booten. I'm here with Janice Young. We're uh, going to be organizing Edmit Weekend this weekend. So if anyone wants to help out, we'd actually greatly appreciate it. We've gotten a great response so far, but especially on Sunday, if you could just stop in for an hour um, at our off-campus housing mixer to just stand around and talk about your neighborhood, we'd really appreciate it. That would be at 10.30 on Sunday, uh, go till about 11.30. Also this Wednesday, we're having a pep rally of sorts uh, to get the rundown on what the agenda is. So if you guys could come to that at noon in 260, anyone who's volunteering. Thank you. There's a link in the SGOV newsletter if you were interested in signing up. Thanks. Thank you. So you guys got the case back, I hope, right? Because I've got all the case grades recorded, so you can't claim you don't get the case back because it's in there somewhere. There were at least four or five groups where only one person was on the email, so I asked them to kind of share with the rest of the group. So if you have no idea what I'm talking about, talk to somebody else in your group. Somebody's got the case. Okay? When I uh, talked about the quiz, which of course is coming up on Wednesday, I said, what you did on the case is the best preparation for the quiz. But if you did something badly on the case, then you want to make sure you don't repeat it on the quiz. Right? So one of the things I want to very quickly hit and run on is what to do about interest expenses and debt payments. Let's back up. Does Netflix use any debt on the studio? Yes, right? It's in the debt ratio. Will it have interest expenses? Of course, if you have debt, there are interest expenses, and there'll be debt repayments. You have two choices when it comes to those interest expenses and debt payments. One is to ignore them entirely and compute your cash flows before those payments and discount those cash flows back at the cost of capital. What you're letting the cost of capital do is carry the weight of the debt and the, the financing choices. That's one choice. The other is you can subtract the interest expenses and if you want to even the debt payments. And what you get then will be cash flows to equity investors and you can discount those back at the cost of equity. 
either way is okay. What you cannot do is mix and match. What I mean by that is you cannot subtract out interest expenses and discount the cash flows you're left with at the cost of capital. That is an absolute no-no. There, no, there is no ifs, buts, nothing. There's no exception to that rule. You cannot mix and match cash flows and discount rates. That's why I was, you know, it might seem like nitpicking, but when some of you called your after-tax operating income net income, I kind of put the comment in saying, don't call it net income because you're going to get, it's, a, it's very easy then to get mixed up as to what you're dealing with. Net income is always after interest expenses. It's an equity income. Operating income is before interest expenses. So if nothing else, start using that language when you talk about companies because it'll make it clearer as to what exactly you're discounting. So the case will actually cover everything. I'm sorry, the quiz will cover everything we did through last Wednesday. So you're saying, why did I even show up to class today? Because we're going to start on the second half of this class. We're going to talk about the choice of debt and equity. And I'll tell you the biggest problem with talking about debt and equity is we already have emotional views, religious views, all kinds of views about debt that we've got to kind of overcome in this discussion. Let me explain. Almost every major religion in the world views borrowing as a bad thing. And if you're a borrower, you're viewed as weak. Only weak people borrow. And if you're a lender, God help you. There's a special place in hell reserved just for lenders because lenders are the real sinners. They are the, the And that, I think, is part of the problem. Is when you talk about debt and equity, there is this moralistic side of you getting up saying, you shouldn't borrow money. That's a bad thing to do. And there are CFOs who bring that to their companies. I can't borrow money. Why? It's not the right thing to do. So for the next three or four sessions, I'd like you to set those thoughts aside. You can't make them go away because they're inside you. And think about debt just as a different way of raising capital. So what we're going to start this session with is a very pragmatic distinction between what separates debt from equity and then talk about what the right mix of debt and equity is for a company. So in effect, we're going to be focusing the next few sessions on this part of the big picture. If you remember the big picture, we're going to first talk about what's the right mix of debt and equity for your company. And the second question we're going to try to address is what's the right kind of debt for your company? Long term, short term, fixed rate, floating rate, dollar, euro. So by the end of this part of the class, you should have a sense of not only how much your company should borrow, but what kind of debt it should take on. So let's set the table first. Let's first draw this line between debt and equity. And the line we're going to draw is not going to be based on what accountants call debt and equity. It's going to be a much more central definition based on what makes them different. So here's where debt and equity are different. First, you guys be lenders. You guys be equity investors. You guys just be umpires. Okay? If you're lenders, the cash flow claim you get is usually a fixed claim, interest payments. You set it up front. If you're equity investors, you get whatever's left over a residual claim. That's the first distinction, fixed versus residual. You're saying, what if I have floating rate debt? It's still fixed, because I tell you what it's going to be given something else, given LIBOR, given the 10-year bond rate, fixed versus residual. Second, usually in much of the world, and this is not true in all of the world, much of the world, when I make that payment to you as a lender, it is tax deductible. But when I give you what's left over, the residual claims, they have to come out of after-tax cash flows. Third, if the company gets into financial trouble, if it has to liquidate, and I get cash from the liquidation, you get first claim on the cash flows, or only if there's something left over do you get whatever's left over. Fourth, much, most debt comes with a maturity. 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Equity in a company is a perpetual claim. I've never seen common stock with a 20-year life. Common stock goes on. And finally, and this is part of the trade-off, in return for giving you a fixed claim that you get first, I also say you have no role in the management. The equity investors run the company. Those are the things that separate debt from equity. And if you use that distinction, you can see every business, no matter how small, how large, private or public, developed or emerging market, has to use some kind of debt and some kind of equity. If you're a startup, the equity might be just your savings. 
As you get larger, it might be venture capital financing. As you get even larger, it might be private equity money. As you get even larger and you go public, it might be common stock. All variations in equity. When you first start a business, the only debt you might be able to get is credit card debt. Basically, you run your credit card up to the max. And there are people who actually want to start businesses using credit card debt. It's a very expensive way of funding a company, because I don't know what your credit card carries. Mine carries a 15.375% interest rate. You think, why would you be crazy enough to do it? Because you're desperate. It's the only way you can raise money. That's your first type of debt. Maybe as you get a little more solid, you might go to a bank and take a loan. And as you build up and become a public company, that might become bonds. Again, what I'm saying is let's not just think of equity as common stock and debt as bonds, because it might take different forms for different companies. This is a universal decision. If you want to start a business, you have to decide how much you're going to borrow and how much equity you're going to fund this business with. So with that set up, let's give a look at some background. This is actually from a very old study. I haven't seen an update, but it does suggest some very interesting differences across countries. These were the G7 countries. Now, of course, as you know, it's become G8 because Russia is part of the process as well. But if you look across the G7 countries, this graph actually shows you how much of the financing of companies collectively in each country comes from internal financing. What's internal financing? That's retained earnings. Basically, the earnings you take plowed back. That's the blue. How much comes from net debt, which is new debt issues minus debt repayments, and how much comes from new stock issues? So if you look at Canada, for instance, about 40% comes from retained earnings, about 40% comes from net debt, about 20% from new stock issues. And it, it, Italy uh, you know, has a bigger proportion maybe of new stock. France has the biggest. But you get to the US, notice something very interesting, at least over the period of the study. What do the new stock issues look like? They look like a negative number. How do you end up with a negative number for new stock issues? Just as net debt is debt issued minus debt repaid, debt, net equity issues is equity issued minus stock buybacks. For much of the last 30 years, US companies have bought back a lot more stock than they've issued. Last year, US companies collectively bought back $550 billion worth of stock, 550 billion. They issued $110 billion worth of new stock. Now that might be a little, you know, part of the reason I think that stock issue looks low is it doesn't count in the IPOs that come in, which are new companies. But if you look at existing companies, seasoned companies, companies that are already public, US companies are giving away more cash, returning more cash than they're raising in new stock issues. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? We'll come back and talk about it in the context of dividend policy. But growing old is tough to do. That's basically it. US companies are aging. And as you age, your investment opportunities dry up. You're going to start returning more cash. So this might just be a reflection of where in the life cycle many of these US companies are, especially in the old economy sectors. And there's also, if you look across countries, a much greater dependence on corporate bonds in the US than in the rest of the world. There, remember, there are two ways you can borrow money as a public company. You can go to the bank and take a loan, or you can issue, go to the corporate bond market. 25 years ago, this difference was even, even starker. 25 years ago, US companies were the only group that actually raised money consistently through bonds. Even European companies went to the bank. Asian companies, Latin American companies, you had no choice. You went to the bank. Bank loans versus corporate bonds. Let me ask you a question. If you're a company and you're trying to decide, let's say you have both choices open to you. You can go to the corporate bond market or you can take a bank loan. Which is a better way of borrowing? Which will give you better rates? Yes. Or you have a lot less control, right? In a sense, I can cut it against you as well, which is it's a market. The market sets a rate. But you're right, it's a market set rate, and banks are, they tell you, right? So at one level, you can say if 
I have a market-based rate, then I will get a fairer rate than the bank, but a fairer rate can be higher or lower, right? So that's one app. What's the, what's the other big difference between taking a bank loan and corporate bonds? Which one are you more likely to be able to refinance? So you can refinance bonds, but a bank loan might not be refinanceable. Under what conditions will a bank loan not be refinanceable? Is if the market's gotten tighter, your financial condition, like right now, Valiant goes out and tries to refinance its debt. It's going to have a lot of trouble with its bank loans, but guess what? It's going to have a lot of trouble with its corporate bonds as well, right? Here's something. When, when you go to borrow money, what are you borrowing for? You're borrowing to take investments and projects, right? Let's say you have a really good project. If you're taking a bank loan, you can actually tell the bank things, proprietary information, that you might not be able to share with the bond market. So for some companies, taking a bank loan might give them lower rates if there is something about the project that they cannot reveal to the rest of the world, but that they can reveal to a bank. That's why even at U.S. companies that have corporate bonds outstanding, some of the debt in almost every U.S. company continues to be bank loans because there are certain aspects of financing where banks will give you better rates. But you know what? It's always good to have both options open. It's better to have both options than only one. And for a long time outside the U.S., you had only one way to borrow money. You went to the bank, and the bank lent you money. On what terms? Whatever terms the bank set. And they all, it was collusion. Basically, so if you're an Indian company, you went to an Indian bank, they said, three-year loan, fixed rate. You say, I'd like a 30-year floating rate. No, three-year loan, fixed. It's like walking into Ford in 1926 and like a car, and you always got a Model T in black. So I'd like a red. No, sorry, black, Model T. That's part of the problem with having just the bank loan market as your way of borrowing money. So I think it's healthy around the world to at least have access to a corporate bond market, and that's increasingly starting to be true. So let me take my four companies. Actually, I, I you know there are two other companies I'll kind of mention in passing. No, I'll take my four publicly traded companies where I looked at the debt, you know, at least with some detail, and look at how they, how much they share in common, and how they're different. So with each company, here's what I've listed. I've listed the book value of the interest-bearing debt that comes right off the balance sheet. That's a balance sheet debt. Right below it, I have the market value of interest-bearing debt. Do you remember how I got from book value to market value? You don't, but I'll, tell, you know, I'll remind you again. So if you have book value of debt, you can act like it's a bond and reprice the bond. So you have the coupon payment and the maturity of the debt. The market value of debt is my estimate of the market value of that debt, and it's pretty close to book value for all of those companies. Right below it is my new debt that I brought on the books because I capitalized lease commitments. This is what you had to do with Netflix. That's a lease debt at each of these companies. So Disney has a significant amount of lease debt. Vale and Baidu also have lease debt. Tata Motors does not, at least in 2013, had no lease debt. Or they didn't tell me whether they had lease debt. That's part, so let me be very clear. There were no lease commitments listed in their 10K, but for all I know, they might have had other commitments they were not revealing. Then I looked at how much of the debt in each of these companies was bank debt and corporate bonds. If you look at Disney, 92% of the debt is corporate bonds, 8% is bank loans. If you look at Vale, 60% of the debt is bank debt, 40% is corporate bonds. For Tata Motors, it's 62% bank debt, about 38% corporate bonds. For Baidu, all of the debt is bank debt. They have no corporate bonds outstanding. In terms of maturity, if you look at Disney, the bulk of their debt is between one and five years. As I describe the debt, I want you to start thinking about what's a typical project for Disney, because remember, we want to match the debt up to its assets, and ask, does that debt make sense? You know, about 49% of the debt between one and five years. Remember, much of Disney's business are broadcasting, TV, et cetera. One to five years makes sense for that. They do have 13% of the debt with a maturity greater than 20 years. And where do you think that debt is parked? What part, which business of Disney's has a long enough life that you would use long-term debt to fund it. It's theme parks. So basically, that's where I expect this debt to be. I could be completely wrong because I really don't know. They just give me the consolidated amount. But if they have any sense, that's where this long-term debt is. When I looked at what currency the debt is in, again, I wanted to think about, oh, for the, uh, let me do Vale and Tata Motors and Baidu. For Vale, 38% of the debt is really long-term debt. 
What's a typical project for Vale? A long-term iron ore mine, right? 30, 40, 50 years. Okay. So again, it makes sense. Again, we'll come back and take a closer look to see. You know, for Tata Motors, 58% of the debt is between 5 and 10 years. Again, nothing there to jump out at me. And for Baidu, 69% of the debt is one to five year debt, which as a technology company makes sense, more short term debt. If you look at what currency the debt is in, for Disney, 94.5% of the debt is in US dollars, 5.5% is in foreign currency. Do you think they have enough foreign currency debt? I know it's very, very back of the envelope. But what's the number we used when we did the equity risk premium for Disney? Does anybody remember how much of their revenue came from outside the US? It was 18%. They had 82% of the US, 18% from outside. It, I know it's very, very rough, but 5.5% debt doesn't look like enough if you have 18% coming from outside the US. For Vale, 35% of the debt is in nominal reais, 65% is in foreign currency. And if you remember Vale's revenue breakdown, what was the biggest market? Come on, you couldn't have forgotten. Remember, this is the answer to pretty much any question you're stumped on in an interview. China, come on. <laughs> get used to it. Just keep using China. Whenever you get stumped, say China. Hey, whatever my question is, what should I discount a cash flow at China? <laughs> yeah. So basically, the, it's 65% comes from outside, which makes sense. Vale is really now a global mining company with a Brazilian base. For Tata Motors, 71% of the debt is in rupees. 29% is in foreign currency. And I think they have a beginning of a problem because as Jaguar Land Rover gets bigger, and it is getting bigger relative to, to the domestic automobile company, you should expect to see the foreign currency debt go up as well. And finally, if you look at Baidu, 18% of the debt is in Chinese, remember, 82% is in foreign currency. What currency is all of China, Baidu's revenues in? It's in China. It's in Chinese, remember. This is a mismatch. We'll have to come back and ask, what do they do about mismatch? Maybe they hedge, maybe they do something else. But if you look at the debt, clearly it doesn't match up. Then I looked at fixed and floating rate debt. Right? Is everybody familiar with how floating rate debt works? Floating rate debt, the interest rate is set up front as a function of some base rate, LIBOR, 10-year bond, whatever it is. And each year, it will get reset as that base interest rate changes. So if the base interest rate goes from 2 to 4%, it's like an adjustable rate mortgage if you want to think about it in terms of housing. Basically, the interest rate gets reset every period. Now again, we can ask, why would you use floating rate debt? We'll come back and address that more directly. But at least looking at the numbers, it looks like for all of these companies, the bulk of the debt is fixed rate debt. Disney and Baidu do have some floating rate debt, but only about 5% of the debt is floating rate debt. So that's where these companies look, uh, are, are right now. We'll come back and look to see whether they have the right amount of debt. So as we start this process of asking how much debt is the right amount of debt, I'm going to go back to something I used at the very start of this class, the corporate life cycle, as a very simple way of thinking about how much should you borrow money, how much should you borrow. So let's start, up, let's, let's start the life cycle. You have a young company. You've just started up the company. You should be funded entirely with equity. Why? Because you don't have the cash to pay the debt. And all your promises in the future, the worst thing you can do is to borrow money and not make a debt payment and have to turn over that potential because you couldn't make a debt payment. So that's the first step in the process. Startups, you should be entirely funded with equity. Let's say you make it from startup to a young company. You actually have revenues and you start. You might not have any earnings, but you have revenues. You should still be equity funded because you still can't afford to borrow money. So you go through that, that phase. You start to grow. You might have a semblance of earnings. You go public, but your earnings are low. Your reinvestment needs are huge. The last thing you want to do is add another fixed commitment. You should still be funded almost entirely with equity. You keep growing. Your earnings start to build up. Your investment opportunities start to scale down because you're getting to be a bigger company. You start to see the beginnings of a debt capacity. You can borrow money, but initially you're going to fight it. You won't want to borrow money. And you've seen this with technology companies over the last 35 years, is when they first become mature companies or start to become mature companies, they continue to act like young growth companies. Why? Because it's so much more fun. I mean, who wants to be a mature company? 
So it takes about three, four, five years of debt capacity building up and the company not borrowing money until something starts to happen. Left to itself, I think these companies would never borrow money. In the case of Apple, what ultimately pushed them over the edge and made them borrow money? It was Carl Icahn. And Icahn is not, as I said, not the deepest corporate finance thinker in the world. But he can identify companies which are not acting their age, saying, you're really a mature company. Why are you acting like a young growth company? How come you're not borrowing money? That's a trigger that pushes you to start borrowing money. So initially, at least, your debt capacity opens up. You don't use it. But ultimately, you start to use the debt capacity. Why? Because there's a tax code advantage to borrowing money. And you're not using it if you don't borrow money. And you become a mature company. Your debt capacity starts to continue to go up. And at some point in time, you start to turn the cycle and you become a declining company, at which point you start paying down debt, but your company is also getting smaller as you start to pay down the debt. So one way to think about how much should my company borrow is to put your company in the life cycle and ask, what kind of company is my company? And then ask, how much debt would I expect it to have? So if you're assessing Pandora, how much debt should they have? Don't think too long. They're all, well, in a sense, they're already being beset by all kinds of forces around them, right? The last thing you want to do is have a fixed payment now that you have to worry about making three months, six months, nine months, or a year from now. My advice to companies like Pandora is don't go looking for trouble. You think, what if it's convertible debt? A lot of young tech companies use convertible debt. You know the only thing debt about it is the name? Convertible debt to a technology company is almost all option. It's a conversion option that is really getting you the money. That debt, is, I don't even know why you bought it. Why don't you just issue it as a warrant and raise the option money? But for some reason, this has become part of the practice. It's convertible debt, so you have a fixed cash flow associated with it, but it tends to be small. So that's one way to think about what, you, your, what your company has to do. And what it allows you to think about is transition points. What are transition points? They, these are when a company goes from being a young growth company to a growth company, a growth company to a mature company. Those transition points are when you're going to start to become aware that your debt capacity and what you actually use as debt are not matching up. So when you look at companies, look for those transition points. I've used this term before. I call these bar mitzvah points. Because basically at each stage, they say, are you growing up now? And you're going to say, no, 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 I want to be 12 years old. And I'm going to come back and say, are you growing up now? It's amazing how long companies want to be 12 years old. They're 85 in, in company age, but they're acting like 12-year-olds. You have to be ready for those bar mitzvah moments in terms of being willing to change the way you run a company. So let's talk about measuring a company's financing mix. Through the next four or five sessions, I'm going to talk about debt ratios. And this is something that's probably going to be useful in the context of the quiz as well. Whenever I talk about debt ratios, I'm first talking about debt to capital. So if I'm talking about a debt ratio of 30%, I'm talking about debt as a percentage of debt plus equity. If I want to give you a debt to equity, I will explicitly say the debt to equity ratio is. So that's just my preference. So when I talk about debt ratios, it's debt as a percentage of total capital. Second, when I do talk about debt ratios, my debt does include lease commitments. Why? Because that's the way I think about debt. It's not just long-term debt. It's not just short-term debt. It's interest-bearing debt plus lease commitments. And third, when I talk about debt ratios, I'm talking about market debt ratios, not book debt ratios. Why? Because I'm looking at what a company can afford to borrow as a percentage of its value, not as a percentage of its book value or whatever the, the accountant tells me the value of the company is. So when I talk about debt, it's almost always going to be, when I talk about debt ratios, it's almost always going to be debt as a percent of capital. It's going to be based on including leases as part of debt, and it's going to be based on market values. So the way I'm going to structure this discussion is today we're going to just talk about the trade-offs. What are the pluses of using debt? What are the minuses of using debt? And in a sense, at the end of today's session, if I gave you a company and said, should my company borrow money, you can at least in a qualitative sense work through the benefits and costs and say, in this company, I don't think we should borrow money. So it's actually a very powerful way to start this process because it lays out the advantages and the disadvantages of borrowing money. I'm going to list, you know, with each one, I'm going to list out the potential advantages and disadvantages. But I first want to remove one 
one factor that I've seen used as an advantage of debt off the table. I've been told by CFOs that it's cheaper to borrow money than to raise equity. Therefore, debt is an advantage. Let's take the part of that statement that's true. Is it cheaper to borrow money than to raise equity? Yes. Why? What did I say the lenders have? A fixed claim and they're in front of the line, right? Where does the equity guy lie in this line? Always the last guy in line. So if you want 7% when you lend me money and I'm behind you in line as the equity investor, I should be charging more than 7%. So it's almost a given that your cost of equity is going to be higher than the cost of debt. That is not an advantage and here's why. If I borrow money, it's true the rate on that debt is lower than my cost of equity, but by borrowing money, I made the equity investors now face more risk. Do you see why? Because you now have to make the debt payment before you get your equity earnings. So whatever I gain by using cheaper debt as opposed to more expensive equity will be offset by how much my cost of equity and cost of debt will go up as a consequence. It's almost amazing, but later I'll come back and prove this with an actual company that if all you have is that debt is cheaper than equity, replacing equity with debt is not going to make your cost of capital go down. So that's not going to be an advantage. So it's got to be something else. So here are the, the pluses and minuses of debt, and today we're going to take each one separately. The two biggest advantages of borrowing money are the following. First, the tax code rewards you for borrowing money. What do I mean by that? Interest expenses are tax deductible. Cash flows to equity are not tax deductible. Therefore, you get a tax benefit from debt that you don't get from equity. It is by far the biggest benefit of debt. The next time you're a politician complaining about the fact that US companies have too much debt, just bring a mirror, hold it up in front of his face, and say, there's the reason. Who wrote the damn tax code? It wasn't Apple, it wasn't Google, it was you guys. And you put in a tax benefit for debt, and why do you then complain about the fact that people borrow money to fund companies? It's the same reason people borrow money to buy houses, if you think about it. There's no reason financially that that's the way it should be. But because you've created a tax code that gives you a tax benefit for interest payments on your mortgage loan, you are going to borrow a lot more than you would have otherwise. Tax benefit of debt. Next benefit is going to, it's a, it's a subtle one. When I say it, you're going to say, what the hell are you talking about? There are some companies where borrowing money can actually make the company a little more disciplined about the way they pick projects. I'll come back and fill in the details. It's not true for all companies, but in some companies, borrowing money can make the companies more disciplined, added discipline. Two biggest benefits. There are three costs. The first cost is a bankruptcy cost. What's a bankruptcy cost? Every time you borrow money, you increase the risk, you might not be able to make those debt payments, right? And if you don't make those debt payments, the game is over. I call this truncation risk. If you don't make it through those interest payments, your business is taken away from you. Clearly, this risk varies across companies. It's lower for ExxonMobil than it is for Pandora, but it doesn't mean that ExxonMobil doesn't have bankruptcy risk. It just is that it climbs slower. They can borrow a lot more before they hit the trigger. So that's the first cost, an expected bankruptcy cost. The second is an agency cost. What's an agency cost? Any time you ask somebody else to do something for you, you have a problem. You know what that problem is? The person you ask doesn't feel as strongly about your interests as you do. It's a fact of life. In the context of debt and equity, here's how it pops up. Whenever you borrow money, you create two interests in the company, right? You have the lenders who want you to do something and the equity investors who want you to do something different. Why? Because if you're a lender, what's the only thing you care about? Do I get paid? Will I get paid? Should I get paid? So basically everything is about, will I get paid my interest expenses? All you care about is downside risk because you get none of the upside. If you're an equity investor, of course you care a lot more about upside. That's going to create conflicts with the company. You say, why do I care? That's a lender's problem. Guess what? The lender's problems become your problems as a company because lenders are going to put in their protections and their protections are going to cost you. That's the agency cost. And the third is, every time you borrow money, you give up some future flexibility. Why do you need flexibility? Because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. 
If you're Netflix or Amazon, you might have the capacity to borrow money, but you have no idea what next year will bring or two years from now will bring. You want to hold back on borrowing money till you find out. So what I'd like to do is take each of these costs and benefits and work through the implications, because you can actually explain a lot of what companies do just with this qualitative trade-off. So let's start with the tax benefits of debt. Very simply put, here's how it works. You're a business, you borrow money, interest expenses are tax deductible. Your taxes are computed after interest expenses. You raise equity, it's got to come out of after-tax cash flows. So if you ask me what the tax benefit of debt is, there are two ways you can measure it. One is, you can think about that after-tax cost of debt and your cost of capital. You borrowed money at 5%, you have a 40% tax rate. In effect, you're borrowing money at 3%. So the higher your tax rate, the lower the cost of debt becomes. The other is you can actually compute it as a dollar value. Remember how we compute the tax benefit of depreciation? You have a billion dollars in depreciation, a 40% tax rate. You save $400 million in taxes. You have a billion dollars in interest expenses, and you have a 40% tax rate. You save about $400 million in taxes. So the higher your tax rate, the greater the tax benefit to borrowing money. That might explain a strange phenomenon. Why do people who need the money the least borrow the most? Because the people who need the money the least tend to be in the highest tax brackets. They have the highest tax rates. With the highest tax rates, that's exactly what you're going to expect to see, is you will go out and borrow money because you get the biggest tax benefits. In fact, let's, let's globalize this. Right? I think I've already mentioned that the US has the highest marginal tax rate in the world today for corporations. Not for individuals, but for corporations. It's a 40% corporate tax rate. The average marginal tax rate for the rest of the world is about 25%. And there are countries with marginal tax rates much lower than 25%. Ireland, for instance, might be 12.5%. Hong Kong might be 15%. You think, so what? What do we just say? The tax benefits of debt are a function of the marginal tax rate, right? So let's say I gave you two airlines, Ryanair, which is Ireland-based and reports its income in Ireland, and United Continental, which is a US company. Let's say you haven't looked at their financials. I know you look at airline financials all the time, but let's say you haven't looked at them recently. And ask you, which of these two airlines would you expect to borrow more money? What's the answer going to be? I would expect United Continental to load up on debt like crazy. Why? Because they get a much bigger tax benefit. It's actually a testable hypothesis. I would expect companies and countries with low marginal tax rates to borrow a lot less than companies with countries in high marginal tax rates. And as companies globalize, you know what's going to happen, right? Because you get to place your interest expenses in the parts of the world where you get the biggest tax benefit. Every company in the world which has a global footprint in the US is going to find a way to borrow money in the US and keep its interest expenses here because you maximize your tax benefits. So you're already seeing the seeds of the inversion debate and all the rest of those debates that come from it, because with an inversion debate, you can actually move your corporate headquarters outside the US, keep your debt in the US, so you get to have your cake and eat it too. You get the interest expenses, getting you a 40% tax benefit, but now your income gets taxed at 24 or 25%. You write a bad tax code, you reap the consequences. So that's the first proposition, tax benefits of debt. So let's build on that. Let's assume that I came to you with two groups of real estate companies. There are two ways you can actually structure a real estate business. The first is as a conventional corporation. In a conventional corporation, you have earnings, you have interest expenses, you have taxes, and then whatever's left over gets paid out as dividends if you want to. The other way you can structure a real estate business is as a real estate investment trust, or a REIT. A lot of hotels in the U.S. have actually spun off their real estate now into REITs. Marriott, their properties are actually owned by the REIT. Marriott itself is just a hotel management company. What's different about a REIT is that it's a, it's, it's a pass-through entity. What, what that means is their income does not get taxed at the entity level. You think, this is great. Why doesn't every company become a REIT? But in return for not being taxed, a REIT agrees to do two things. One is it has to stay in real estate. So REIT can't go into 
you know, travel management, et cetera. It's got to be pure real estate. And the other is it is required to pay 95% of its earnings in dividends. Why does the IRS require you to do that? Because they can't tax you on the income. They're saying, we'll tax the people who get the dividends on their income. We're going to get them one way or the other. It's a pass-through entity. But it is true. REITs don't get a tax advantage at the entity level because they don't pay taxes. Real estate corporations do get a benefit. Which of these two groups of real estate businesses would you expect to have more debt. So if I gave you all real estate corporations in the US and all REITs and I gave you the debt ratio of the two groups, which one do you think will have the higher debt ratio? Real estate corporations should, with one caveat. REITs do get a tax benefit from the debt, but it shows up at the investor level. Do you see how it shows up at the investor level? If you borrow money, you have less net income. If you have less net income, you have to pay less dividends. So indirectly, you might get it, but then it depends on the marginal tax rate of the investor who collects the income. So if pension funds own your REITs and they pay no taxes, then nobody gets a tax benefit. You should never borrow money. But if you're owned primarily by wealthy individuals with 45% tax rates, maybe you'll borrow more money. So don't be surprised to see a REIT borrow money. It might just be because the end investor still gets a tax benefit from that debt. So when you look across companies, if you see big differences in tax rates across companies, you should expect to see big differences in debt ratios as companies. Anybody doing cruise lines as, as part of their group? Do you even remember the company you picked for your group? <laughs> there is a company you picked. And nobody picked cruise lines like Carnival Cruise Line, Royal Caribbean, no? When you, if, if you get a chance, though, even if you didn't pick it, go look at the tax rates that cruise lines pay. Have you ever been on a cruise? I've been on one cruise. I will never be on another one again. This is a truly debilitating experience. Okay? You get on the cruise, you're trapped on this big ship with a lot of food. I guess that's the, you know, so they have enough food to feed three of you all through. For the first 30 minutes after you leave the coast, nothing happens. Nobody comes around. You want food, and nobody's around. After about 30 minutes, everybody starts showing up. Do you want drinks? Do you want this? Do you want that? You know why? Because they wait until they're outside that, the coast, whatever it is, 15 miles away from the coast, and then they start selling everything because then they can claim to be on the high seas when they sell you all that stuff. So the taxes they pay on that is actually claimed as income in the middle of nowhere. So you look at the tax rates for Carnival Cruise Lines, they're about 3%. I've always wondered why investment banks don't just have big boats. <laughs> no, worth thinking about it. The Goldman Sachs boat, you come on it as traders, they send you out 25 miles, you trade from out there, at 4 o'clock they bring you back. Maybe they can give you lots of drinks on the way back too, right? You pay for them before you cross the line. It's a novel concept. Maybe we should start moving everything offshore. Okay? But tax rates do matter, and it can affect how much you borrow. Now let's talk about the second argument for that. Remember we talked about corporate governance, where managers often put their interests over stockholder interests, especially at companies where managers don't own very many shares, and stockholders are dispersed. So let's assume you have a mature company. A mature company with lots of cash flows coming in, not very many uses for that cash flow. There aren't that many good projects. But it's run by managers who really think of it as other people's money. So when you come to them with a bad project that makes only 3%, they say, you know what, I'll take the bad project. Who's going to notice? I, mean, I have so much in cash flows, I can cover up my mistakes as I go along. If you force this company to borrow money, do you see how it might make the managers a little more disciplined in their thinking? So if they go out and borrow money, what do they now have to make as payments every period? They have to make interest payments. Now if you take the bad project, what could happen to you? You could go bankrupt. And if you go bankrupt, what happens to the manager's salaries? They go to zero. In other words, you want managers to feel the pain of taking bad projects. And one of the ways you might be able to make them feel the pain is by forcing the company to borrow money. It's a really tough argument to get intuitively. 
In fact, this is called the Jensen free cash flow argument for debt. I'm going to talk. Remember Jensen's alpha? He likes attaching his name to pretty much everything he does. This is Jensen free cash flow argument for debt, where he said, if you have companies with lots of cash flows and the managers don't have a stake in the company, you want to raise the stake by making them borrow money. So I'm going to give you my own analogy that helped me understand this added discipline argument. I call this the Volvo argument for debt. Let's say it's five years out. You've gone to work at an investment bank. You moved up the ranks really fast. You're now a managing director. You move to the suburbs. You live 15, 20 miles away in this big house with two dogs, two cars, two spouses, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> and every day, you take the train to the station. They've offered to send you a limo, but you prefer the train. Yeah. And you have two cars, as I said. Your first car is a Volvo 960 extra armor. Do you know what I'm talking about? Side airbags, front. It's like driving a tank around town. Your second car is some kind of a tin trap. I don't want to insult any of your cars. But let, it's a Yugo. Are there any Yugos around? It's a Yugo. It shakes when you get in. And when you drive on the highway, things start flying off the car. It's your second car. So it's your first day. And it's your lucky day. You get your drive, your Volvo to the train station. You live only five minutes away. You drive it to the train station. You park the car. You get on the train at 7 in the morning. You go to work. You work all day. You work all evening. You work all night. That's how you have the two dogs, the two cars, the two spouses. 10 o'clock at night, you drag yourself off the train. You're exhausted. You just want to get home. You crawl to your car. You can't even walk anymore. You get in the car, and you start driving home. Remember, you're only five minutes away. One problem, there is a traffic light between the train station and your house. So you pull up to the top of the hill. The light turns red. You say, oh, drat. Those would not be the exact words you use, <laughs> but I'm censoring as I'm going along. And as you sit there watching the red light, illegal thoughts start to cross your mind, right? What if I run that red light? There are two, two risks you have. One is that a policeman might catch you and give you a ticket. But these are the suburbs. At 10 o'clock at night, they've all gone home. So you're not going to get a ticket. The other thing you worry about is getting hit, right? Initially, that stops you. But then you remember you're in your Volvo extra armored. If somebody hits you, you get a little dent on the side. The other guy's all crumpled up. But that's his problem. You run the red light. You make it through safe. The next day, you repeat this process in your Yugo. 7 o'clock in the morning, you drive your Yugo and you park your car in the station. 10 o'clock at night, you get into the Yugo, you pull to the top of the hill. The light turns red again. It's like a conspiracy. You get ready to hit the gas pedal to go through, just like yesterday. Then you remember, you're no longer in your Volvo. So what am I thinking? Guy on a bicycle comes along and hits me. I could roll off the road. <laughs> and you stop. You're saying, what's this got to do with debt and equity and good projects and bad projects? Think of the Volvo as an all-equity funded company. Think of the cash cushions the company has as airbags. Think of the red light as a bad project. Why do you run the red light? I protected you so much from your own mistakes that he said, who cares? Think of the Yugo as the same company stripped off its cash. And think of why you stopped for the red light. You were afraid of getting hurt. My problem with the Jensen free cash law argument is it went further. It actually was used to justify LBOs in the 1980s. And in LBO, you don't just borrow money. You borrow way too much money, right? It's like taking even your Yugo into the car dealer. And even Yugos come with little air balloons. They're too small to be bags, actually. But a little balloon comes out. Taking into the car dealer and asking them to replace the air balloons with air knives. You know what those are? A knife comes right out. And then ask yourself, would I ever drive this car? You'd probably walk to the station. You'd walk 15 miles rather than get in the car. That's what happens to companies that borrow way too much money, is every mistake you make could become your last one. Managers get paralyzed. So somewhere between the Volvo and the air knife, there's a happy compromise. And that's what you're looking for. So let's build on this. I'm going to show you three groups of companies. And I want you to focus just on this argument of using debt to make managers more disciplined in their choices. And you tell me in which of these three groups of companies you're most likely to use debt to discipline managers. The first, all three of these, all three groups have very little debt. The first group of companies are privately owned businesses. we are the owner of a privately owned business. Do you need debt to make you more disciplined in your project choices? If you do, you have a serious 
problem you got to deal with. It's a psychological problem. You want to destroy yourself. So if you own your own business, you shouldn't need debt because it's your own money. But so let's take the other two. The second is publicly traded companies where stocks are held by millions of investors. The shares are dispersed across thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of investors. The second group are publicly traded companies which have an activist investor or investors in the midst, a Carl Icahn or a Bill Ackman or whoever it is. What, which of these two groups do you think will need more debt? Why two? You're right, but why? Why? Because they've not. Or even if they did, what are you going to do? Let's say I own a thousand shares, and I call you know Facebook and say, "You guys should be borrowing a lot more debt." They're going to hang up on me and say, "You're a crank." So if you have lots of small stock orders, even if we all agree that the company can afford to borrow more money, there's not a whole lot we can do. But if you have an activist investor, maybe he or she can do that pushing for you. So it's the second group where you'd expect to see debt. So I would expect debt to be a much better disciplining mechanism at an AT&T than at a Facebook. Why Facebook? It's Mark Zuckerberg's money. If he wants to leave $10 billion of tax benefits on the table, it's a conscious economic decision he's made. at and they're not even thinking about it because it's not their money. What do they care about $10 billion of tax benefits? So that's the second big benefit of debts, is the tax benefit. Those are the two, I'm sorry, the added discipline. So those are the two big benefits of debt. Have I missed any benefits? Maybe you can think of other benefits of borrowing money that I haven't. But you know, if you do, you know, let's talk about them. Because sometimes people think of benefits of debt that I haven't even conceived of. No? Yeah? The capacity to make bigger projects. You know why you are linking the two is because you automatically assume your capacity to raise new equity is constrained. If you want to bring that in, then you can say, look, by borrowing money, I can get bigger faster because and then I'm going to push you. Why aren't you willing to use equity? And it might turn out you're not willing to use equity because you control 51% of the company, like Sheldon Adelson did. And you want to build a casino with equity because that'll mean you go to 44% and you lose control. So it is possible, but that's really something else driving you towards debt rather than equity, not just the size constraint. Okay? So let's now talk about the cost of borrowing money. None of this should be, you know, corporate finance related. These are things we always worry about when we borrow money. You borrow money to buy an apartment. You take a job at a consulting firm. You have to better get down on your knees every night and say, please, God, don't let this job go away. Because if it does, you have a problem. You've got to make those mortgage payments. So the first thing you worry about when you borrow money is there is a bankruptcy cost. And there are two components to expected bankruptcy costs. The first is the probability that you will run into trouble. What will that depend on? How predictable your earnings are. If you're a company in a business where you have very predictable earnings, you have a lower probability of bankruptcy for the same amount of debt than a company where the earnings go up and down. Already, you, could, you should start thinking about utilities versus technology companies and why one might be able to borrow more money than another, even if they have exactly the same earnings. That's the first factor. The second is the cost of bankruptcy. I'm going to ask a question. It's going to sound like a ridiculous question, but humor me. What is the cost of going bankrupt? You're saying my equity is going to be worth nothing. And by the time you actually go bankrupt, that's already happened, right? Your stock was seven cents, five cents, three cents. The actual act of bankruptcy is not what made you poor. It's what happened in the years before. But once you declare bankruptcy, where do you end up? You end up in the legal system. Incredibly efficient system, right? <laughs> I still remember when I became a citizen of the United States in the mid-90s. I was very excited about six months later to get a letter in, in, the, in the mail informing me that I was now a U.S. citizen and that I now had a duty as a U.S. citizen. Guess what the letter was for? Inviting me to jury duty. To show you how naive I was, I was actually excited about the prospect. <laughs> I actually circled the date in my calendar and said, I'm, I'm make sure I don't miss that date. I put on my best clothes, which might have been even a tie, which for me is a huge concession. <laughs> I show up at the courtroom expecting balloons and celebrations, first jury duty. There's a bored-looking woman sitting behind a table. She said, what are you here for? 
I said, I'm here for jury duty. She said, go sit in that chair. I said, what do I do? Watch the screen. What am I looking for? Your number. Where is it? She showed me a number. So what happens if my number doesn't come up? Come back again tomorrow. I said, I can't keep coming back every day. She said, don't worry. We pay $8 a day. I said, OK. <laughs> I'll come back for the rest of my life. But it gives you a little, little window into how the legal system thinks of your time, right? In fact, everybody in that courtroom, other than the lawyers, the time is time value of money is not even in the, it's not even a concept. That's the system you're going to end up in if you go bankrupt. The court system. In the 1970s, there was a study that looked at railroads that went bankrupt, which is pretty much every U.S. railroad went bankrupt in the 70s. That's how Amtrak was created. And what it looked at was a very simple mechanical question. How much time elapsed between the time a railroad went bankrupt and creditors got paid? You know what the actual the time was? Seven years. And creditors got 50% of the value of the assets as, a, as assessed. So half the value of the assets went to cover legal costs, and it took seven years to get paid. Do you know the Lehman thing is still not done. There's still numbers going around. So at 2016, when did Lehman go bankrupt? 2008. The collective legal bills on Lehman alone are $2 billion. That's the direct. I call this the deadweight cost of bankruptcy, which is once you go bankrupt, it's almost like your money gets sucked out of you know, lots of different places. It doesn't go to the lenders who've been owed money for 10 years. It goes to, you know, Bankruptcy lawyers. In fact, if you, you know what the, 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 the priority of claims in a bankruptcy is? Who gets first claim on the cash flows? The government for taxes due. So they collect. Right below them are bankruptcy lawyers. How the heck did they creep in there? I've been owed money for 15 years. I've been waiting to get paid. And they get ahead of me. But to show you that this isn't likely to change, about seven or eight years ago, Congress has one of its dec once a decade thing of we're going to rewrite the bankruptcy laws. So there's a congressional committee. They have like 32 witnesses or experts they call in front. So I took a look, look at the, the list of 32. 31 of them were bankruptcy lawyers. <laughs> so they're probably saying, do we need to wait for you guys to collect? Could we go first on the list and then you can collect taxes? So that's a direct cost of bankruptcy. But I'll give you the other cost, and this is the cost that truly scares me. So I call this the indirect cost of bankruptcy. Could the perception that you're in trouble actually put you in trouble? Let's say you're a company, and people start thinking you're in trouble. Now, all you have to do is look at Valiant right now to see that happening, right? Because the perception that you're in trouble starts to spin out of control. In what ways? If people think you're in trouble, let's say those people are, your cust are customers. What do they do? They stop buying your products. A little more difficult with the Valiant, but if you're an automobile company in trouble, I stop buying your car because I don't know whether I'll get the spare parts. Your suppliers start demanding cash, saying, I don't know whether you'll pay me. So that affects your working capital. Your employees start checking out monster.com while they're sitting at the desk, saying, I don't know whether I'll have a job in six months. The perception that you're in trouble can very quickly put you in trouble. In fact, during the crisis, this was a huge issue. Because the spiral then was so quick, you could go from being a viable, financially solvent bank to an insolvent bank in a week if the rumor mill took you know, Morgan Stanley almost went under in October of 2008 because the rumor mill started. And before you knew it, the whole thing started to spin out of control. You can see this happening at Twitter right now, right? The perception they're in trouble. You can see employees starting to leave saying, it's a huge problem at some companies. And if it's a problem, don't make it worse by going out and borrowing money and putting yourself into that circle. So here are the two implications. If you have more volatile earnings than cash flows, you should borrow money, less money than a company with more stable earnings. Stating the obvious, but might as well state it. Maybe this is the reason a Google or a Facebook or an Apple holds back on borrowing money. Because if you look at how much cash they have available to service debt, in fact, I heard Carl Icahn say Apple should borrow $500 billion. 500 billion. And you know what? Today they can service $500 billion of debt because they borrowed 500 billion at 4%, which is, you know, 
that would be 20 billion dollars in interest expenses last year alone they had 47 billion dollars in cash flows they could service the debt but it'll be it'll be insane of them to go out and borrow that much money because they're not in a business where they can count on those earnings and cash flows coming in year after year the second is holding all that's constant the greater the potential bankruptcy cost you face as a company both from direct and indirect sources the less you should borrow so let's try to make this real again I'm gonna offer you three separate companies let's say they have the same EBITDA the same EBIT same level of cash flows right now and you're trying to figure out which of these companies should borrow the most so the first company is a grocery store the second is an airplane manufacturer the third is a high-tech company so let's start with the easy one which of these three companies should borrow the least okay what about the high-tech company should make so in terms of the fundamentals of the, 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 the bankruptcy cost we talked about what is it about the high-tech company that should lead it to borrow less uncertainty about future earnings your business could change your market can change in fact I, I mentioned at the start of this class about the life cycle of technology companies being compressed you go from being a young company to an old company overnight so high-tech companies should borrow the least between grocery stores and airplane manufacturers think indirect bankruptcy costs you're going to see the answer let's say a boy got downgraded to double B Say something bad happened. They got downgraded to double B. What does a typical contract for Boeing look like? Singapore Airlines signs a 15 year contract to deliver 12 Dreamliners, right? These are really long term contracts. If you're a double B rated airplane, manu you know, aircraft manufacturer, you're going to have a real problem getting those airlines to sign those contracts because they're not sure you're going to be around. When I was in Canada three weeks ago, I valued Bombardier. If you're familiar with Bombardier, they, they make not the big aircraft, but if you take a, you know, one of those smaller aircraft, you know, com commuter aircraft almost, yeah? Bombardier is a big manufacturer. Bombardier and Embraer are the two big competing companies. And Bombardier is in a huge amount of trouble. It has incredibly large debt load that it can't service right now. I'll wager it's getting in the way when Bombardier goes out to an airline and says, will you buy our aircraft? The airline looks at them and says, we like your aircraft, but how do we know we, you'll be around? Indirect bankruptcy costs are much greater for an airplane manufacturer than for a grocery store. Think of why. I don't know about you, but I don't walk into a grocery store, stop and check. Is this a AAA rated grocery store? I frankly don't care. It's not like I plan to bring the lettuce back in two years. If they're around tomorrow, I'm okay. Which is part of the reason some of the most successful leveraged buyouts were done at grocery stores. Because what happens in a leveraged buyout? The day after the leverage buyout, your company now has a double B rating. You'd be insane to do a leverage buyout of boy. But I can understand you doing a leverage buyout of Safeway because you can still operate with a double B rating as a grocery store. So it's not just about can I service the debt today, it's looking at the expected bankruptcy cost going forward. The second cost is an agency cost. Remember the way I described it? Any time you ask somebody else to do something for you, you got a problem. See how it's going to manifest itself. I'm sure you have lots of group meetings this, this month. By the end of this month, you're going to be so sick of your fellow MBAs that you will never want to see them again for a while, and that's why you have a summer break. Okay. So let's say it's a group meeting two weeks from now, maybe for this class, to get your project done. So that's kind of a hint meet it's late in the evening one of you offers to go pick up sandwiches for everybody else in the group so you give in your order turkey on wheat no mayo lots of mustard you're the one taking the orders you half listen you leave you get to the front of the line so what did she want again I don't know ham on white lots of mayo I don't care no she's on a diet not my problem she's allergic to ham oh, it's, no. again that's the nature of agency costs when you ask somebody else to do something for you you got a problem if you're a parent this manifests it itself whenever you hire a babysitter my wife and I used to go out three times a year and you're gonna see why very quickly after I describe a typical going out experience this was when my kids were small um, so usually this takes like a six week window to get a babysitter lined up and you gotta have a babysitter and a backup babysitter and a backup to the backup babysitter. The babysitter agrees to show up at seven, seven twenty-five or seven thirty, she does show up. 
you're thankful that somebody did show up. So you hand over your kids, your third or fourth or fifth most prized possessions that day. You know, take care of them well. And so we'll go to a restaurant. They go to bed at 9 o'clock. It's one thing. Don't feed them any sugar after 9 o'clock. And you leave. You go to the restaurant. 9 o'clock comes around. The babysitter's in front of the TV watching, I don't know, Pretty Little Liars. <laughs> My daughter watches it all the time. I have no idea what's going on, how this has gone on for five years. You know. <laughs> how can you not solve a murder when everybody's talking about it to everybody else? I have no idea. You know? But there's this weird little pull. You know, what, what are these people doing? You know? So she turns on Pretty Little Liars. Kids can sense weakness. I mean, it's amazing. Right? <laughs> So they come down the stairs and they say, we want ice cream and candy. So the babysitter has two choices now. She remembers instructions, say, no ice cream and candy, go back up. But then there's zero chance she's going to watch Pretty Little Liars because those kids are going to make sure that she won't. The other is she can say, take all the ice cream you want. And by the way, take the sugar bowl upstairs. <laughs> and when it's done, I'll bring you more sugar. And you go back to watching the show. 10 o'clock, you come home. You pay the babysitter. She runs out of the door really fast. She's wonder why she's leaving so fast. She jumps in a car. She takes off at 80 miles. She's gone. She's got your money now. You go upstairs. Your kids are not really wide awake. They're bouncing off the walls. So what the hell did you do? You've been eating all the sugar in the house. That's a classic agency problem. There are two ways to deal with an agency problem. The first is what I call the monitoring solution. You know what that is? You put cameras all over your house to watch the babysitter and the kids, and you carry a monitor with you no matter where you are. You could probably do this on your smartphone now. While you're having dinner, you watch the kids. They're coming down the stairs now. She's opening the freezer. She's taking out the ice cream. Then you have to figure out some mechanism for either zapping the kid or zapping the babysitter <laughs> to stop this process. That's a monitoring solution. That's really tough. You probably end up in with with some you know, diaphragm or something if you do this, so you can't do this. The other is you build a cost in when you go out, which is that if you go out, you're not going to sleep that night. Your kids are going to be awful for the next day. And if you build that cost in, you don't go out as much. That's the three times a year. Now let's say, make this about debt and equity. I've kind of set this up already. So you guys be the bank. You guys be equity investors. Let's go borrow some money. So we come to you to borrow money. When we borrow the money, we describe the projects we're going to take as safe or risky. Really safe. In fact, I look after this money as if it were my own. Let's say you're a trusting banker, which is an oxymoron, because you don't say trusting. You, but you say, look, you look honest. You have a billion dollars. So now you've got a billion dollars, no strings attached. You did tell the banker you're going to take safe projects, but there's nothing that forces you to. Now that you have the billion, do you think your incentives might be different? Yeah, you might take some really risky projects. What if they go bad? Well, you declare bankruptcy, limited liability. You go to the bank and say, you know, that pro money I borrowed, I took a really risky project. It's all gone. But you can take whatever assets we have and liquidate them. So what assets do you have? None. But if it pays off, what happens? You get the upside. This is an asymmetric game, which means that if you're lending money to the equity investors, first, you can't be a trusting banker. You've got to be a very cynical banker. So when they say save, oh, what you hear is very risky. So rather than set a 3% interest rate, you set it at 15. Why? Because I know you're going to lie to me. So I set the interest rate up. Then I hire lawyers to watch over you. That's a monitoring solution. And guess who pays for those lawyers? It's not the bank. You will have to pay. It's built into your interest rate. So when I lend money, I either will charge you a much higher interest rate built into the cost, or I'll put in constraints on what you can or cannot. If you've ever looked at a private business loan agreement, you'll see it runs to hundreds of pages of things you cannot do. There's a reason for that. And every time you borrow money, the way I describe it, it's like being in a straitjacket. And every time you borrow money, the straitjacket gets tighter and tighter. Should you care? Some companies don't. For instance, if you're a regulated utility, you don't care. Why? 
because you're already in a straitjacket because of the regulatory restrictions. So you don't care that lenders don't want you to do all this other stuff. You couldn't do it anyway. But if you're a technology firm, you see why technology firms are going to be much more wary of borrowing money? It's not even that they cannot service the debt. But by having this debt, they're going to be constrained in what they can or cannot do. So tomorrow they decide that virtual reality is where the future lies. If you Google, you can go out and spend 50 billion. Nobody stops you because it's all equity money. But if you've borrowed money and you have ratings to worry about, it's going to be a factor. In fact, it's going to be fascinating to see how Tesla. You know how many orders Tesla has for the Tesla 3? 276. It's actually up to 286. They keep upping the number. 286,000. The problem is the Fremont plant, I think, has a capacity of 150,000, maybe more. Which means they've got to build these big assembly plants that are probably going to cost four, five, six, seven billion dollars. And what I'm, as, an, as a potential investor, I like Tesla, but at the current, not at the current price. One of the things it'll be worth watching Tesla for is how they finance that six billion. Because if they finance with debt, they're playing with fire. You see why they're playing with fire? Because they could have huge potential, but if they, if they fail to make those debt payments, all of that potential goes to somebody else. Somebody's going to buy these assets for a fraction of what they're worth. So if you look at it from the perspective of where Tesla is as a company, the only way they should be financing this plant is by issuing new stock, new equity. Because if they borrow money, they're going to be so constrained in what they can do that I don't see how they can pull that off and make all those plans they have to grow in the future come through. So let's carry this to the next step. So if you're looking at this notion of agency costs, so think purely from that perspective, and I gave you three companies. And again, we've kind of answered the question. Technology firm, a regulated utility, real estate corporation. Which one's going to have the greatest agency costs? First, it's the, you can see why regulated utilities can borrow more than technology firm. They don't value flexibility. There's another aspect to agency costs that I think is almost as much mental as it is you know, financial. For whatever reason, lenders seem to feel more uncomfortable lending money against things they cannot see than they can, they can physically see. What am I talking about? You build a big building. You cover it with gold. You put your name on it. You can borrow whatever you want because it's physical. People like to drive around. That's the building that my loan. But if you're a pharmaceutical company, you could be developing patents every single day with huge cash flows. But for whatever reason, banks don't like to lend money on your assets because I know accountants like to use the word intangible for them. If that's a word you want to use, that's fine. But it's basically a fact of life. Companies in businesses which are physical assets seem to be able to borrow more money because lenders feel more comfortable lending against physical assets than they do against intangible assets. So if your company is in a sector where your assets are physical, people can see them, you're far more likely to be able to borrow more money than if you're a company in a business where your assets are intangible. So all those factors will come into play, and that's part of the reason, I think, in real estate, Lenders are so willing to lend as much as they do. Because it doesn't make any sense to me that just because I have a building, you're willing to lend me all this money when that building might have 80% you know, vacancy. But for whatever reason, I'm able to pull that off. Because people don't seem to think about the cash flows. They look at the physical assets, and they lend on that basis. So the last cost here is every time you borrow money, you give up some future flexibility. Why do you need that flexibility? Most com some companies might not, but if you're in a business with uncertainty about the future, how it's going to evolve, then you have to be careful about borrowing money today. And sometimes the rules of the game can change from under you. I'll give you an example. You know those yellow cabs out there? You do know them. You see them all the time. How do you get the right to operate a yellow cab in New York City? You have to buy a medallion. You know how much a medallion cost four years ago? 1.5 million was the price of a medallion. It's part of the reason the guy driving your car is not probably the owner of the medallion. Right? Million and a half. Most of these medallion purchases were funded with significant debt. 70% debt, 80% debt. Because the history of New York City cab medallions was this is almost a monopoly. 
Because what New York City gives you in return for the meda medallion is the number of yellow cabs in the city has been capped at about 14,000 for the last 35 years or, four, or so. So what they say is, look, you have to pay a lot for the medallion, but we'll make sure that there are only a restricted number of cars on the street. And four years ago, that looked like a pretty good promise. It had worked for about, what, 75 years of the Taxi and Limousine Commission that you had a monopoly. So you borrowed 70% or 80%, you bought that medallion. Then what changed? You had ride sharing. You know what the price of a medallion is now? It's down to 800,000. In fact, the best indication that ride sharing is killing the taxi cab business is what's the price of a medallion? You can actually go online and check the price out. It's dropped about 50% in the last four years. So no matter what the, the cab drivers or whatever the association would say is about ride sharing, it's killing the yellow cab business. You're saying, what's this got to do with that? That money you borrowed to buy the million and a half medallion four years ago, you're now in serious trouble. In fact, there is a publicly traded company who's, who, whose business actually is financing these medallions. It's on the verge of bankruptcy, precisely for this reason, because it lent money on a business which it thought was stable and predictable, and the business has changed under it. So that's basically what you're factoring in when you think about borrowing. So let's see if CFOs actually bring these all, because we've laid out the pluses and minuses. Let's see what CFOs claim they look at when they borrow money. So this is the result of a survey that was done of CFOs where they're asked, when you go out and borrow money, what are the factors you keep in mind when you borrow money? Starting with most important, least important. According to these CFOs, the most critical factor for them when they go out and borrow money is maintaining financial flexibility. I'm not sure whether this, but so this is what at least they say they look at. Second is ensuring long-term survival, which is the bankruptcy cost. Third is maintaining a predictable source of funds, as opposed to what? As opposed to equity, where you depend on the stock price being high or low. Fourth is maximize stock price. Fifth is maintain financial independence, maintain a high debt rating, be like everybody else in the sector. You know how I know they're lying in this survey? They said that the least important factor was maintaining comparable to the sector. I'm going to show you some statistics that suggest that that's not true. That that actually is way up the list, but it doesn't sound right. If that's what you're doing as a CFO, I'm going to ask you, why am I paying you all this money? Why don't I just take the industry average, use it? Because that would be so much cheaper. Yeah? No, they were just asked, what are the factors you consider? So it didn't actually scale to how much debt they had. So maybe they should have looked at only high debt companies. Maybe the answer would be different than if you looked at low debt or average debt companies. So does across CFOs have all companies? So this person, is it specifically for It's specifically for debt. It's only for debt. Right? We'll talk about the other factors that come in when we bring in other types of financing. Right? So here's what the trade-off looks like. Tax benefits and added discipline on the plus side. Expected bankruptcy costs, agency costs, and loss of financial flexibility on the other. If the benefits exceed the costs, go out and borrow the money. If the costs exceed the benefits, don't. The problem, though, is you try to apply this for a real company, you're going to very quickly start running into, how do I put a number on these? So that's going to be the next phase. But before I do that, let me actually see how this trade-off, on a very qualitative level, can be used, at least for my companies, to decide whether these companies should be borrowing more or less. If I look purely at the tax benefits for debt, Disney gets the biggest tax benefit, Disney and Bookscape, because they get a lot of their income in the US, get that 40% tax rate. Tata Motors gets the next tax with a 32.5% marginal tax rate in India. Baidu gets a 25% tax benefit. And while Vale has a 34% marginal tax rate in Brazil, there is an offsetting benefit you get for equity in Brazil called interest on capital. What that is, is if you're a Brazilian company and you raise equity, you're actually allowed to take a percentage of that book equity you have. And the percentage is set by the government. This year, for instance, 11.5%. You take 11.5% of the book equity, allowed to claim it as a tax deduction. So essentially, that was the Brazilian government's attempt to kind of give equity a tax benefit as well. It's kind of ham-handed. It doesn't fully work, but at least the benefits are going to be smaller because of that. When you think about discipline, the benefit should be highest at Disney, where there's the biggest separation between stockholders and managers, and smaller at the other firms, because they're either family-run or founder-run, because there's always somebody in the background. If 
for expected bankruptcy costs, the volatility in earnings is highest at Baidu because it's a technology company, Tata Motors because it's a cyclical company, and Vale because it's a commodity price driven company. Iron ore prices can go up and down, and it's probably lowest at Disney simply because they're in so many different entertainment businesses. Indirect bankruptcy costs, likely to be highest in Tata Motors because it produces a product that, that consumers are worried about you know, getting spare parts. It's probably lowest at Disney. Nobody goes into Disney theme park and says it's become a double B rated company, let's not go. Okay. So it's less of an issue. Yeah. For agency costs, it's highest at Baidu because you can't see what you're lending against. They claim to have a search engine, but how do you know? They claim to be doing research, but how do you know? Whereas it's lowest at the other companies because they have physical assets. And at Disney, the theme park investments have lower agency costs than lending against a movie or a broadcasting business. Much more difficult to track. And in terms of flexibility, the younger a company, so Baidu will value flexibility a great deal more than Disney and Tata Motors should because of where it is in the life cycle. So what I would like you to think about is, I know you can't do this today because you got the quiz on Wednesday, but once the quiz is over, I'd like you to revisit your company and take it through this trade-off. What are the tax benefits? What are the bankruptcy costs? What are the agency costs? And at least at a qualitative level, ask, is, that, is my company the kind of company where I'd expect to see a lot of debt or not very much debt? Okie doke, I'll see you on Wednesday. So if you're, not going, if you're going to miss the quiz, remember you got to let me know before 3.30, I'm sorry, before 10.30 on Wednesday. You could take a patent and sell it off too, right? Yeah, but there are banks across. They lend against nuclear power plants. How liquid is a nuclear power plant? Who are you going to sell it to, right? And so it's almost the physicality. I mean, there might be all these issues of liquidity, right? But remember, if you're lending against real estate because it's liquid, under what conditions are you going to get this truck? Real estate prices drop. The real estate prices drop. You know how difficult it becomes to get rid of real estate without getting a huge liquidity discount. You see, that every time there's a housing price, banks end up possessing these properties. You don't know what to do. With. Yeah. So liquidity in good when when business is nice and healthy, liquidity is good across all this. Business gets bad.
actually do if you it depends on how much you worry about those covenants. So if you're a regulated utility, you don't care. What are those covenants going to do? They're already restricted. If you're a company that is in an unstable business where things are changing, you're going to worry a lot more about those covenants because you say, how the heck am I going to keep those covenants and do whatever I need to do to survive in this business? So that goes to this financial flexibility issues. What kind of business are you in? How predictable is it? Because the more predictable it becomes, the less you care about covenants. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, coming up. Yeah. You want to come talk today? There's a lunch with a CEO also. Okay. With who? CEO. Who's CEO? Neil Rader? Uh, uh, I do fish.